So Taylor, I brought with me a collection of a few of my favorite things. This is my collection of remote controls <laughs> oh, that wow, I have at yeah. my house. That's right. Wow. This is uh, my TV remote. This is a universal remote. I don't know how to program and work. Uh, this is uh, one that does my air conditioning. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. This is one for a PlayStation 5. What? You, I didn't know you got one. I don't have one. I just have their controller. <laughs> I can't afford the actual... You're waiting to... Okay, okay so I'm yeah. saving up. I'm yeah. saving up. Okay. Now, you, this one looks familiar to you because this is the one that controls the fan that's in my office. Can't you, can't you reach the fan from your desk, though? Yeah, it's right here. It just sits right there. But, but see, you have a remote for it anyways? It's a controller. It's not... See, I control the fan. I could do this, but I just do this. See? See how this... That's a lot of work. It sounds like you've... Sure. It sounds like you really like remote controls, and, and specifically, oh, yeah. you like the control part of remote controls. That's exactly right. That's why sometimes, like if we didn't have electricity, my wife just went and got the remote for me and just gave it to me to hold, like as a pacifier. <laughs> and I just held it. Cause Trying to change the, the channel? Yeah, 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 but I just have to have control. We're going to leave, we're gonna leave these over here for the sermon. Okay. Um, I, I'm, well, you're too e tempted easy. by it, I yeah, think. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the control thing, it's, it's not just here that I struggle with. Uh, see, I, I've actually started thinking, what if there were controllers, not just for my electronics, but for like all of life, especially my relationships? Uh-oh. Uh, just stay with me. This is what was on my mind when we didn't have electricity because I didn't have anything else to do, so I just thought. And uh, I was holding my remote, and I thought, what if I had a relationship controller? And I was thinking about your life, that it would probably be easier for you if you, because you got little kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, so three-year-old, Gemma, uh, what if she wasn't sleeping one night? This has happened I'm to familiar. you. I'm familiar. You're familiar with this story? And you could just press a button that said sleep. Uh-huh. Are won. you warming up to this uh, idea? Okay, you're, win right. you're, you're, you're so, winning me over. So, yeah, your son also was sick this week, Tatum, yeah. uh, on top of Gemma being sick and your wife being sick. But anyway, so what if you just had like a be healed button for him, you know? That would be pretty cool, right? And I, we talked about this. You, you thought about it in terms of your phone. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I've shared with this. I've shared with you before that I wish that I could like slide down my forehead and hit "Do Not Disturb" like I do on my phone. Yeah, like an iPhone. Where, yeah, where I could, you know, where I could like silence all notifications incoming around yep. me. That would be wonderful. Wouldn't that be good? I mean, I think yeah. I'm onto something here if it was yeah. actually possible to do. Yeah. And I don't think it is because I've been trying my whole life to control people. <laughs> now I don't like to admit that out loud. Some of you just did an uncomfortable giggle, like, <laughs> "Oh no, that's terrible." But I don't, I don't think I'm alone on this one. Uh, but I, I've developed it into kind of like an art form, the thought that I'm in control of other people. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a lot of therapists about this. Uh, one time my wife and I had to go to therapy about it because she was making some decisions about her career and I was leaning in like a lot to the point of not just leaning in, I was trying to actually make the decisions for her and then convince her that she was making the decisions. You, you didn't want to have a say you wanted the say. I want the say. I yeah. had a plan, and yeah. it was going to be glorious if she would just follow it. And uh, so she and I ended up in counseling. Shocker. Uh, and we were sitting there one day, and the, the counselor was like, well, tell us what's going on. So I unpacked this whole thing with what I'm trying to do. I'm innocent in it. You know, we're just having disagreements. It's all her, Becky's fault. And uh, she's here, you know. She, she, just a reminder. She's in the she's front here. row. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, Oh, don't worry, she's going to feel good about this when she remembers this moment. When the counselor actually stopped me and she said, Becky, do you understand what Wes is trying to do right now with you? And Becky actually came to my defense and she said, what, it's nothing bad? And she said, oh, no, no, he's trying to control you, Becky, and you're letting him get away with it. And she was like, what? Oh, yes, he is. And that changed everything. <laughs> and she started standing up for herself and stuff. But I couldn't believe my own therapist called me out. And actually her words were the... Uh, you're, you're trying to control her. The problem is, Becky, he's just really good at hiding it. 
Uh, that's even more dangerous. Yeah. But uh, this issue of control, it's been there for my whole, whole life. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll be disappointed because somebody didn't do what I wanted them to do. You know, in my own mind, I could control that. It's an illusion, but it's been something that I've struggled with, and I don't think I'm alone. Help me out. No, no. I, by, while we appreciate your vulnerability, your honesty, I, I don't think you're alone. I think every human struggles with control, the desire for control. No matter how holy or sanctified someone might seem, they still struggle with this desire for control. And in fact, we see an example of this from Scripture from two of the 12 disciples who we would think would be like some of the most holy people, some of you know, the people closest to Jesus that shouldn't have this problem, they even did. We read in, in Matthew's account of Jesus' life, um, two disciples, James and John, who ask Jesus this lofty question and say that th when this new kingdom is established, they want to sit to the right and the left of Jesus. Here's what that means. They want all the power. They want to control. They want to be in charge. And they want Jesus to make it happen. Now these two, these two brothers, James and John, they were actually nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here. To get the nickname Sons of Thunder, you're not a quiet person. <laughs> you're not a passive person. You're probably a pretty loud and aggressive person. And so when James and John make this you know, declaration, this request to Jesus, the other disciples notice and become pretty agitated or irritated. So Jesus, being the great teacher that he is, brings everyone together, all the disciples together, and has a little um, you know, lesson, a little one-on-one -on -one when it comes to control and power. Here's what Jesus says. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Read this next phrase with me. Ready, set, go. Not, Not so, so with, you. with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus makes a clear distinction here. There will be some people who try to lord power over others. They try to exert control, but then clearly Jesus says when it comes to his followers, not so with you. And then Jesus gives them a different way to live. A way that doesn't exert power and lord authority over others, but a way that serves others, not calls to be served. A way that instead of trying to be more than enough on their own, a way that yields to the God who is more than enough. And we've been in this series, walking through Paul's letter to the Colossians. We've been reminded of this timely and beautiful truth week after week, that Christ is enough. And as we're going to look at today, Paul reaches this, this tension point in the letter where people are trying to exert their control or figure out who to give their authority and power to in their life. Remember, these are people that are struggling with false teaching that Paul's writing to. And they're trying to determine who's going to be given lordship of their life. And Paul is writing to direct and correct them that the one person who should have authority and control over their life, the one person that they should yield their control to is Jesus. And so that's where we left off last week yeah. in, our, in our letter. And he deals with this um, lordship issue about who's going to lead and be the Lord of our life. And he has a sweeping statement. We touched on it last week. It's in Colossians 3, 16 and 17. He says, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Read the rest of this with me, everybody. Here we go. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, the key word in that statement is the word whatever. <laughs> so it's all of life. Jesus is Lord of all of life. And then how are we to live our life? Well, even in our relationship, by what we do and say, that we're to do it as a representative of Jesus. Now, some of us have been representatives before, a little known fact. I uh, used to work, uh, right at, at the end of college, I worked for State Farm Insurance. You, you know, they got all the commercials. In fact, before it was Jake from State Farm, it was Wes from State Farm uh, calling. And uh, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Now, what they told me in the training is, like a good neighbor, it's not Wes is there, it's State Farm. 
And when I would go to a car wreck or something like that or uh, visit with somebody about an insurance policy, I did so as a representative of State Farm. And in a similar way, this is what Paul is saying that we are to live our lives as. We are to live out our lives as a representative of Jesus Christ, even when it comes to our relationships. And then Paul, giving this truth about being a representative and the importance of that, Paul then, what we're going to look at today, dives into very specific practical examples of what it looks like to live as representatives in our relationships. Now, we're going to look at this scripture as a whole, and I promise we're going to go back and break down each part. Um, but let me give you some context surrounding what we're about to look at. Paul gives three pairs of relationships. He gives the example of husbands and wives, parents and children, and masters and slaves. Here's what you need to know. There's some differences among each of those relationship pairs, but there's some, also some similarities. One similarity is this. In each of those pairs, there were uneven power dynamics at that time. So the time of the first century where Paul is writing this, the power dynamics in each of those relationships are uneven. Meaning that one part of that pair had social and cultural influence and power. And the other part of that pair did not. It had very little or none. There was vastly uneven power dynamics in these pairs. The second thing that, that we need to know is this. Paul gives clear instruction to every single group. He doesn't leave one out. Nobody's off the hook when it comes to living as a representative of Jesus in their relationships. And Paul gives clear instruction to all, everyone in the pairs, all six total groups that are named. So we're going to look at this as a whole. Then we're going to go back and we're going to break down each part individually. Sound good? Um, as I'm reading, I want you to do this. Here's what I want you to do to start. I want you to look for what's a, what's an, what's a phrase that's used or a word that's used over and over again that you see within here. Let's, let's dive in. Paul writes, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands... Love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your irreverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favorites. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Now what's the pattern we see here? What's that phrase that's used over and over and over again? It's the phrase, the Lord. It's a phrase that indicates power and authority, and, and Paul uses it multiple times. He talks about belonging to the Lord, pleasing the Lord, fear of the Lord, remembering the Lord. And what Paul is doing is he's honing in on what the secret is for all of our relationships, what important foundation he wants the people, the Colossians to know, and what he wants us to know today, and it's this, that Jesus wants to be the Lord of all my relationships. Let's read that together. Ready, set, go. Jesus wants to be the Lord of all my relationships. Now, when we read this, I know it, it, it's tough letting go. Because I would often, I would already read that and go, I know Jesus wants to, but Taylor wants to be the Lord of all my relationships. And you might do the same thing. It can be tough letting go. It can be scary letting go. But we're often reminded of the teaching of Jesus that letting go and letting him be the Lord leads to life in the fullest. That a full life comes by surrendering to him and his lordship in our life. And if you think what was just read sounds countercultural today, just wait until you discover how countercultural Paul's words were in the first century. Yeah, so the typical first century, here's what was going on. Imagine a household, and in your mind, this is, uh, it's not uh, the same way a house in Lee County, Florida looks uh, before the hurricane. It, uh, it, actually was structured this way. Usually the houses were two-story. On the top floor uh, was not a man cave, but it was instead like the guy's penthouse. Uh, so the head of the household, the man, uh, the husband, lived upstairs, and he had the whole place to himself. Down below, there was, so outside there was a ladder. He could go down if he wanted to. Uh, then on the bottom floor 
was where the animals, uh, his wife, his children, and his slaves all resided. I first learned this when I was 16 years old. Pastor George taught it to me when he was taking a uh, course in seminary. He was my youth pastor. George is a lot older than me, in case you all were wondering. (laughs) Um, So I was 16. George was really old. Uh, And so he was teaching me this. And I remember being stunned just at that cultural difference. Because I remember thinking, my mom would never go for this, right? I mean, this is crazy. So this is what he's writing to this kind of a culture. And to begin to break it down a little bit, let's think about the first pairing of relationships, um, that of marriages. In the first century, marriage couldn't be more different than we often think of it is today. Um, Because what did love have to do with it? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. These marriages were arranged, they were betrothed, um, and so your feelings, it didn't matter. People were uh, placed in these marriages, often at a young age, and when Paul says um, instructions to wives, Nobody would have blinked an eye because of the dynamics. Let's look at again uh, verses 18 and 19. Uh, Because Paul writes, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those belonging to the Lord. And everybody would be like, yeah, of course. But then he says this, Husbands, well, read the rest with me. Love your wives and never treat them harshly. Now, uh, let's understand a couple things about this. First, the word submit is not what you might originally think it to be. Uh, the word submission here is the word hupostasso in Greek. <laughs> That's like one of nine words I know. <laughs> hupostasso, because it sounds so weird. And it means to yield or to be obedient to. And it means to do so not out of some kind of weakness, but out of strength. So uh, a person came to me and they said, I've got, I'm in this relationship and uh, this guy is abusing me and I'm trying to submit to him. And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out, time out. <laughs> This is not submission out of fear that Paul is talking about. This is submission out of strength. Uh, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's, a, it's a choice, not being forced into it. And so we need to know, know that. But the, the second half of this is what really balances the scales. Because Paul here and other places, as well as I believe the entire Bible, has one uh, continuous thing when it comes to the relationship between men and women. And that is that we are uh, equals in the eyes of God. That Husbands are to love their wives. The word there is the word, Greek word agape. And it, is, it actually means divine love that gives up its life for somebody else. And so wives submit to your husbands. Yeah, husbands, uh, give up your lives, Paul would write in Ephesians 5, for your wives just as Jesus did for the church. So what is this? This is about mutual submission out of strength, not by force. Jesus himself hupostasod to his parents. Uh, Luke chapter 2 tells us that Jesus was obedient to Mary and Joseph, um, and he made that choice, of course, since he's the Lord, out of strength. Now, here's what's the shocking part. No other ancient text in history ever affirms the inherent worth and value of wives on the same level as husbands until right here, right now. And Jesus does this throughout his entire ministry. He elevates the status of women Uh, to the point that the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection are women who come to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning. And so what we're seeing here is that Jesus values all women in his life and ministry and that he raises these two parties that were often in that society uh, uneven and he puts them on level ground. All right, that's the first one. Second group of people uh, are parents and children Again, in the ancient world, the children are at the weakest uh, status here, uh, and it's dramatic. They were held in such low regard that uh, if children had anything wrong with them, they could legally be abandoned in the Roman Empire. Uh, a philosopher named Seneca wrote these disturbing words, we drown children at birth when they are weak and abnormal. And that is sickening to think about, isn't it? And yet that's part of the world that Paul is living in and that he writes to. So talk to us about how this is completely shocking, the next part, when he affirms the relationship that children have with their parents. Yeah, so let's look again at at Paul's words to children and parents. So he first says, Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Once again, everyone would probably then would go, Okay, yeah, of course. But then here comes the shocker. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. 
Now that word discouraged, it literally means losing heart or like a crushed spirit. And so Paul sees, gives instruction to parents to not do things that would aggravate or cause their spirits to be crushed of their children. So here's what Paul does in that moment. Paul gives credence to the idea that children have a heart and soul. That they are not less than, that they are not property, something to be cast aside and forgotten about. That they are people to be valued. And Paul is following in the footsteps of the teaching of Jesus. Don't forget that Jesus, that we read in, in, in the Gospels, Jesus has this, this kind of tiff with his disciples. When the disciples are at one point trying to shoo children away from him. And you know, don't bother him. And Jesus sort of stops this from happening and says, let the children come to me. It was Jesus who boldly flipped the script on how children are viewed in society. And Paul is following suit here with his command to parents and to children. He's leveling the playing field when it comes to God's grace and value in each and every person. And then Paul does it again. Let's look at the third pair. Slaves and masters. Now, here's what we need to keep in mind. That we are reading an ancient text through modern eyes when we read this. That this was written back in the first century, and so the way they understood it and read this is way different than the way that we're going to understand and see it today. Sadly, slavery was a reality back then. And people wouldn't even bat an eye at what was said. Um, and in fact, how this, sort, how this worked most of the time is that when there was war, and believe me, there was a lot of war then, uh, the losing tribe, the people that were left, that, the, the, the tribe that was conquered, uh, they would just kind of divide up people, and those people would agree to do household labor and, and become you know, the slave of a master, of someone in the household. Um, once again, this was kind of par for the course back then. So here's what you need to know. Paul is not writing a ringing endorsement of slavery. Paul is re re acknowledging the reality of slavery. That's what Paul is doing here. And he's acknowledging the reality that there is a master-slave relationship. In fact, Paul himself was descendants of slaves. I mean, when you think about it, the, the, the chosen people, the Israelites, were, were enslaved in Egypt by the Egyptian pharaoh. And they were freed when God sent Moses to free his people from slavery. So slavery was a widespread reality then. But then no one would have batted an eye at that. But then what Paul said to command for master, his command for masters, people would have batted an eye at. Here's a reminder, here's Paul's words. It says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. That's the command for slaves. And check out what he says to masters. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. So if people were hanging, hanging around for the first two relationship pairs... This is probably where people really were like, wait a second, Paul. That's not how this works. No, masters, I don't have to be fair and just to, to my slaves because that's not the way this relationship works. But here's what Paul did. Once again, he echoed the teaching of Jesus that there's value and inherent worth in all people, including slaves. And so what Paul does is he levels the playing field again. And as, we'll, as we see later in history... When the world at last abolished the institution of slavery, who was it that led the way for this? It was Christ followers. It was people that dared to speak up and say that there's inherent worth and value in every single human being. That God's grace and love is on each and every person. That they have inherent worth and value. That they're children of God and people of worth created in God's sacred image. See, Paul leveled the playing field just like Jesus did. Yeah, we prayed the Lord's Prayer earlier, Taylor, and it seems to me this is the kingdom yep. of God that uh, followers of Jesus are to be the advanced representatives of. Yes. And it is history altering. But let's, let's think about it. Let's, let's bring this a little closer home. Um, because we, we've learned that the ground is, is level at the foot of the cross. <laughs> but how does this apply to, to us? Because there's a temptation that I have when I look at this text, like, Woo, we've come a long way now, haven't we? You know, we don't, we don't do those things in these human relationships that we have. You know, we treat our kids good. You know, we treat our spouse well. And uh, we've done, you know, away from the slavery and all that kind of stuff. So maybe we're, we're too advanced for this. But then the Holy Spirit won't let me off the hook. <laughs> because I think this still applies, the principles apply to all of our relationships. So I'd like to invite everybody to do a little inventory of your relational world right now. 
if you would just imagine your relationships, all your network of relationships, and just kind of do a little survey, how you doing in your relationships? Heard a story about a kid that did this. He was uh, sitting under a tree one day, and he started taking inventory of his life and his relationships, and he said, so far, I've got uh, 17 people who love me. I've got 22 people who like me. I've got six people who tolerate me, and I have three enemies. I'd say that's not too bad for a little kid. How about you? How you doing? You might want to think of it from, from your lens. Do you have some people that you love? Some people that you like? Some people that you tolerate? Do you have an enemy or two in your life? This is just you and Jesus. Be honest. If one of those last two are sitting next to you, don't look at them or anything. But <laughs> Now, let's remember the big idea today of this whole section of Scripture is this. Jesus wants to be the Lord of all my relationships. Not just the ones that are going well, not just the ones that are easy. People that love us, we love them back in Jesus' name. Well, that's not too hard. <laughs> it's the other categories that are difficult. And so, how do we live this out? I think Paul helps us here because normally in, when I'm reading Scripture, there's like these headers that the editors have put in you know, for Scripture that's actually not in the letter that Paul wrote. And they're break down of different sections. But if we just look at it as one text... He talked about all these relationships, and then he moves you know, to the next verses, or these, uh, chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That's why I'm here in chains. Pray, there it is again, that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So, Taylor, help us understand what is the connection between prayer and what we've been talking about, our relational world. Yeah, so as, as you had said, you know, if we're, if we're taking all the headers and all the stuff that were added later, this is the next thing for Paul. Paul issues this radical, countercultural challenge of how to live as a representative of Jesus in our relationships this really tough way, to, you know, tough thing to do. And then he goes next and says, devote yourselves to prayer. And when you stop and think about it, it makes so much sense. Because prayer is the literal first step in the act of letting go of control. That when we pray, we look to God, who's our higher power, and we acknowledge that he has more power than we do, and that there's something we need to let go of and ask for his help with. Prayer is where we look to God and go, God, help me with my broken relationship, my obstacle, my problem, my dilemma, my, my grief, whatever it might be. We look to God and invite him in and ask him to help. Prayer is the literal first step in letting go of control. And there's a humility that's in prayer. And Paul actually models this humility too. Where Paul you know, asks, asks for prayer from people. Paul, the, the master, the church planner, the missionary, the apostle, the, you know, the leader Paul asked for prayers of the people. And I think that's a beautiful spirit of humility that, that we can take on too. Because what prayer does is prayer leads us to places of surrender and humility. That's where prayer leads us. And it's not just with other Christ followers that it leads us to this. Prayer leads us to places of surrender and humility for people that are different than us, for people that don't believe, for people that, that might believe something different than we do, prayer leads us to these beautiful places of surrender and humility where we allow God to be our guide instead of us trying to figure it all out. So here's the connection that we made, at least for our own lives, yeah. when it comes to this uh, connection between the two passages of Scripture. And uh, it's just a take-home for all of us to think about it in prayer, and that is this question, who are you going to pray for in your life right now it's hard to love, for you to love. Who are you going to pray for that is hard for you to love? Uh, several years ago, I had a relationship that was filling on all those gaps that you talked about. And uh, me and this person were just not getting along. And I decided it's probably best if I just unfriend them on Facebook and ghost them when it came to texts or phone calls. And uh, Pastor George and I, I submitted myself to his accountability and I told him this. And uh, he said, well, I have one question for you. Have you prayed for this person? 
And I said, no, uh, no, <laughs> I've just made this decision. And uh, he said, well, why don't you pray for that person for a month and then we'll see where you're at. And Taylor, I didn't want this to even happen. I started to pray for that person three times a day. I set an alarm. And bef in a couple of weeks, three weeks, I began to actually care about them. How annoying, right? I actually began to love them and care for them. And I began to see different things about their past and how they were hurt and why they... And God changed my heart uh, towards this person. And so this question, we put it to the test. And I'd like to invite all of us to be thinking of somebody. Again, if they're next to you, don't squeeze their hand right now. Uh, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> no, just, just you and the Lord make a little deal. Make a pact here. That you're going to pray for the person in your life that's hard to love. Why don't we do that right now? Can you yeah. help us? Yeah, absolutely. I want to invite our worship team uh, we're going to close with a chance for you to live this out, um, a chance for you to take some intentional time right now to pray. Um, and so I'm going to read just, just a bunch of different statements, a bunch of different prayers, actually. And if it applies to you, I'm going to give you just a, quiet, a few quiet moments after I say each one. And I want to invite, you know, between you and God, for you to just say that prayer however is applicable for you, as we invite Jesus in to be the Lord of all our relationships. So Jesus... Be the Lord of my marriage. Jesus, be the Lord of my parenting. Jesus, be the Lord of my relationship as a child to my parents. Jesus, be the Lord of my friendships. Jesus, be the Lord of my small group. Jesus, be the Lord of my workplace and my relationship with coworkers and bosses. Jesus, be the Lord of my school and the relationship with teachers and students. Jesus, be the Lord of all my relationships. Friends, this week I want you to keep trying this. I want you to be intentional and, and, and mark, mark down a list of, of relationships that you're going to invite God to take control in. That you're not going to try to lord your own power or authority over it, but instead you will invite him, the one who loves and knows you most and best, mm -hmm. to be the lord of relationships in your life. Let's stand for prayer. So God, we look to you. We yield control over to you. As scary, as uncomfortable as that might be, um, God, we acknowledge that life lived in the fullest is yielding control and authority to you and who you are. God, we offer to you our relationships, all parts of them, all, all the different relationships that we have. God, we ask that in areas that we're trying to hang on to, areas that we're trying to control ourselves, things that we know need to happen that we've been neglecting to do, things that we need to stop doing in relationships that we know you've told us to stop doing. God, would you help us with this? Lord, we surrender control over to you. We ask you to be the Lord of our relationships. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing one more song today, friends, about, about reigning Jesus as the king of our heart. And I want to let you know the altar is going to be open during this time of worship. If you'd like to make your way up here and pray, you can. Uh, we have a team that will love to pray with you. And Pastor Lawrence is up here as well. And I know he would love to pray with you if that's something you'd like to do. You can also make your seat a place of prayer if you're interested in that. So let's sing together. Let's pray together.